everybody, welcome to Bold. It's been such a gratifying experience for my family and I to, to walk around today and see all of you here making the effort to come out and experience what we do at Bold face to face, particularly in this environment. You know, we coined the word Bold more than seven years ago, but the events of the last year and a half have underscored how truly bold it is to do what you folks do. At MindBody, our business was born in the wake of the dot-com bust at the beginning of this century. And the events of the last 19 months have presented to us some of the largest challenges of our careers. And so we thought, what better way to open this event up under the theme of Unstoppable than to talk about what do we see happening in the future? After this opening event, you're going to be having the opportunity to go to multiple different uh, venues inside of this uh, facility, hear different experts in the industry. But I thought I'd frame the conversation today by asking some fundamental questions. What has changed? What has changed since March of 2020, when a global pandemic that none of us could have foreseen happening came and annihilated our business as we thought for a while? And even more important, what remains the same? That's the theme that we're going to talk about for the next hour here. I know one thing that hasn't changed and that does remain the same is the underlying importance of the wellness movement in our society. In fact, I would argue that all of us here are engaged in the single most important and largest opportunity of our age, and that is helping people live healthier, happier lives. This has never been more paramount, hasn't it? Look at, look at the facts around the COVID pandemic. Who are the people that have been most Im impacted by it, who have been most damaged by it? Who are the people that have suffered the most hospitalizations and the people that have died? Disproportionately, vast majority of them have the pre-existing conditions of obesity, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, cancer. These are the things that the wellness industry addresses, right? And of course, wellness isn't just about physical fitness. It's not just about moving your body and eating the right things. Wellness is a whole person concept. Wellness that says, sure, first and fundamentally, we have to have bodies that work. Because without a body that works, life is really, really hard. But we also have to have stable and meaningful relationships, the social well-being. Because life without friends, life without family, life without people who love us, is a truly empty life. We also have to have the ability to manage stress. And boy, are we dealing with a lot of stress today. That's the emotional well-being component. We have a need to be intellectually stimulated so that we can grow our minds and le learn new things every day. We have a need for jobs that don't just put food on the table, but also provide us with meaningful careers. And last but not least, we all have a spiritual well-being component need, and that is to have a sense of understanding of what is this life really about after all. And I don't know about you, but for me and my family and my loved ones, the last year and a half have been a time to really reflect on all seven of those dimensions. And what you folks do every day in your businesses is you deliver on all of those dimensions for people. It's not just about fitness, is it? So that's what MindBody's committed to. That's the nature of our purpose help people live healthier, happier lives by connecting the world to wellness. So each of you now has a decision to make. And you probably have already made some pretty important decisions. And those will be, these are going to be meaningful conversations over the next two days. Given everything you know about the world today, the status of the pandemic, the status of the geopolitical environment, the status of the economy, Given all the unknowns, what do you do as an entrepreneur? Do you stay the course? Are you adapting? 
Are you perhaps shifting course in a way that enables you to better serve your customers and better succeed in the new realities post-COVID? And by the way, when I say post-COVID, obviously I don't mean COVID's over. What I mean is post the onset of COVID changing our lives. What about a complete pivot? Is it time to completely change how you think about your business and how you deliver to customers and clientele? Or is it time to step on the gas to double down? Well, I've had conversations with many of you here and many others in this industry, and I personally know of many examples of every one of these responses happening right now at the same time. And the purpose of, of this opening conversation with the folks we're about to bring on the stage is to talk about the elements that help you make these decisions, these critical decisions in your own business and personal lives. And one way in which we can think about this is what we've come to, to talk about in MindBody as the five essential traits of successful wellness entrepreneurs. By the way, these are essential traits of every entrepreneur, uh, but most definitely in the wellness industry. Number one, an authentic level of enthusiasm. This is enthusiasm that is informed by actual knowledge and experience. And every one of you here in this room has actual knowledge and experience in your field. And this may sound incredibly obvious, but I meet many entrepreneurs who are trying to dive into some endeavor and they don't really know what they're doing. They don't really know how the industry works. And I know that each one of you has put that time and energy into your businesses. By the way, enthusiasm is different than passion. A lot of people use the word passion. You gotta be passionate about your work, right? But passion doesn't have a nature of the outcome in it. Enthusiasm is different. Passion, you, there are crimes of passion. Enthusiasm means you are motivated by something that actually makes the world a better place, that actually improves people's lives. Well, grit. Now, there's something that we've had a lot of time to think about in the last year and a half, isn't it? This sense of perseverance in the face of difficult odds, in the face of previously unimagined obstacles. Every one of you has demonstrated that. And the fact that you're sitting here in this room right now reinforces that point. There's something we call agile thinking. You know, there are kind of two kinds of minds out there, perhaps people that love the details. And you know, if you think of the metaphor of a telephoto lens, on an old style camera, zooming into the, the nitty gritty details of your business, the numbers, um, the metrics and so forth. And then there are other kind of people that love to zoom out and see the big picture of what's going on in the world. What's happening in my market? What's going on with competitors? How is technology changing? How are, how are uh, consumer tastes changing in our environment? To be successful as a wellness entrepreneur, you have to be able to do both. And I talk about this in my book quite a bit because it's absolutely essential. There are failures on both sides. There's failures in being too zoomed in on the details and missing the big picture, literally missing the forest for the trees. And there's, there's failure on the other side of being so up in the big ideas that you're not paying attention to what's right in front of you in your own business. So successful entrepreneurs have to be able to do both. We call that agile thinking. How do you do it? First of all, recognize your nature. What is, what is your dominant hand in terms of how you like to think? And so if you were right-handed and suddenly you broke your wrist and you couldn't write with the right hand, you'd have to write with the left hand, wouldn't you? You'd have to train your brain to think, to operate that way, develop that muscle memory. And that's really the answer to this. If your nature is to go one direction, spend more time doing the other so that you balance out your capability. The next is effective decision-making. Successful entrepreneurs constantly are faced with decisions, almost on a daily basis, important decisions in your business. Some of these are, are business essential decisions that will, that will change the outcome forever. Others are just the daily kind of things you have to deal with. How do you make good decisions? Well, if all you're doing is thinking about analyzing numbers, it's not gonna help you understand what you really want. So the analysis is the head. That's the conscious mind that understands facts and figures. But the other side of this is the heart. The heart is the house of your desire. What do you want? What do you really want in your business? And the third is what we call the gut, and that is the subconscious. The subconscious mind has the ability to process enormous amounts of information 
and make decisions in a really impressive way. Have you ever been interviewing somebody that you were consider hiring, and they had the perfect resume, the perfect background, but something in your gut is just, just bothering you. You're finding yourself trying to talk yourself into that candidate. Have you ever had that experience? How many times did that candidate work out well? <laughs> Somebody just raised their hand. <laughs> What's happening there? A combination of your heart and your gut is telling you no, and you're trying to talk yourself into it. The opposite is true. Somebody is presented to you, and I'm using, I'm using the hiring example, and perhaps a resume doesn't quite work. They don't seem to match exactly what you thought you wanted, but something is really compelling you for this candidate. That's when it's time to really listen. You're trying to talk yourself out of this person. Maybe there's something there that your subconscious is seeing. Understanding how to tap your head, your heart, and your gut in decision making is vital. And last, but certainly not least, how do you adapt to new realities? Boy, is that a strength that we've all had to exercise in the last year and a half. Adaptability. We have no way of knowing precisely what's coming in our world, in our lives, but we do know one thing for sure, and that is the pace of change is not going to slow down. And I think sometimes uh, as we get older in life, we indulge in a, in a kind of conceit of believing that the world didn't used to be so complicated. You know, back in the good old days, we didn't have so many problems, did we? Well, I would challenge that belief system, and I would defy anybody to define a decade in which you is actually better than the decade we're currently living in. Let's just do a brief review of our recent history. The 21st century. When you look at the last 20 years, what you see is an almost constant pace of crisis and innovation, and oftentimes the crises actually stimulate the innovation. The, wellness, the modern wellness movement, typified by most of the businesses represented in this room, really began in the late 90s. Sure, there were yoga, Pilates, and spinning studios before the, the late 90s, but that's when it suddenly hit mainstream. And that actually accelerated when the dot-com boom of the late 90s busted. A boom, by the way, that fueled a whole lot of technological innovation that your businesses are riding on today. We know this because you're riding on MindBody uh, and many of our partners. The foundations of that were laid 20 years ago. But what happened in the 21st century? Well, 9-11 happened. The war on terror happened. In 2008, a financial crisis. Also, the emergence of something called the cloud in 2010. And when we talk about climate change, we can't say that climate change happened at any particular moment. It's been happening for a very long time. But what has happened is a global awareness, a sense of urgency and imperativeness that is affecting every decision that people make today to a large degree. And of course, the current crisis of COVID-19. What's really interesting is that if you look at the evolution of the wellness movement, you kind of overlay it over this period of crisis and innovation, you find some interesting facts. First of all, there was a first wave of wellness started back in the 80s. That's when large health clubs emerged. By the way, they were enabled by personal computing, personal computers in the early 80s, and the baby boom generation willing to spend more money on their own fitness and well-being enabled the health club movement. That's when the International Health and Racket Sports Association was created. Um, that's when 24-hour fitness, crunch fitness, most of the big brands of fitness were created in the early 80s. It was personal computing and VHS tapes. Why VHS types? All those workout videos that popularized group exercise. The second wave starts in the late 90s. It's another generation, Generation X, going into their, the decade of their 30s, now their peak spending years, starting to take care of themselves. The emergence of the internet, high-speed internet. And what that enabled was a new business model called boutique wellness. What most of you are engaged in in this room is a business model that was enabled by those technological innovations. And that wave has continued. It's still going on today. And that's why you show it as a line that passes all the way through to the present day and into the future. But around 2008, a whole nother wave started. And this is fueled by yet another generation, the generation of millennials. Cloud computing. Cloud computing enabled much more powerful real-time systems of data. The ability to deliver personal computing into our hands with smartphones. You know, it was 2007 
when Steve Jobs held up that first iPhone and changed all of our lives. Much of what you see today in the wellness industry, the emergence of global brands with hundreds and sometimes thousands of locations, uh, the ability to aggregate available classes and appointments, the ability to engage in dynamic pricing, those innovations were enabled by the emergence of these new technologies and a new generation and stimulated by crisis. One of the things we've seen at MindBody is that in every financial crisis, there seems to be a new wave of entrepreneurs entering the wellness industry. So our question today, the question that we're gonna ask our guests to address is what's coming in the fourth wave? Because the COVID pandemic has hit the industry in, with such strength that we, there's no doubt in our mind that there is a, there's yet another wave about to happen. That's the conversation we wanna have this week and we're gonna kick off right now. So the question I'd like each of you to think about is this. What are, going, what are the things, what are the opportunities, the innovations, the catalysts, if you will, that are gonna define the wellness industry in the decade ahead. And to help us get our thoughts stirring on this, we're gonna bring out a panel of industry experts. First is Chris Stevenson. So Chris Stevenson is a wellness entrepreneur, actually the fitness industry. He's just launched a new brand he's gonna tell us about in January, and he's a board director on the International Health and Racket Sports Association. Amy Boone Thompson is a VP and general manager at IdeaFit. Amy is a well-known speaker in the fitness industry. She's a thinker, she's an innovator, and an entrepreneur in her own right. Please welcome Amy. We got Fritz Landman from Class Pass. Fritz, Fritz uh, cut his teeth at Microsoft. He's a technology innovator. He was a head of corporate strategy there for a, long, for a while. He became uh, an investor an angel investor, invested in some small brands like Pinterest, right, and Square. Uh, and then he met Pyle Kadakia and learned about Class Pass. So he was the driving force behind the, the capital for Class Pass, and now he's the CEO of Class Pass, leading them into the next decade. Fritz Landman. Lisa Starr. Lisa Starr is a representative from the spa industry. She began her career as an esthetician at the age of 20. She rose to spa management, ran multiple successful spas. Today she's a consultant and speaker in the spa industry. So please welcome Lisa Starr. So I thought what we could do folks to kick it off is, is just ask you, how has COVID already changed how you think about business today? Chris, you want to kick us off? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to. Is this thing on? You know, it's been a long time since a live event, so things like this you got to check. It's kind of like when you're muted on Zoom and you've done 100 of them and you still screw that up. Yeah, uh, well, so we had to wear pants and shoes. That's the difference. Uh, yeah, I almost made that mistake, so yeah. thank goodness, because we're in these high chairs. Uh, so, so my journey was interesting. You know, I've been in the industry for over 20 years, and uh, I had a studio model that I operated for years, and then a full-service boutique health club that I operated for years, and then moved into the consulting space where we do workshops and trainings and facility management for people, and then was just about to get back into the brick and mortar with a company from the UK called Energy Fitness Clubs. And what was interesting, this was right pre-pandemic. So the model for Energy Fitness Clubs was a lower cost, high level of experience type of club, with a small footprint and a lot of members. So as we know, as the pandemic hit, the last thing you wanted was a small box with a lot of people crammed into one spot. So that was right, I mean, we were, the deal was finalized. We were gonna go to work for them and help them bring this brand and, and all throughout the United States. And then you can imagine how disappointing it was, the pandemic hits and all of a sudden, everything we'd been working so hard to prepare for was simply off the table. So after a few moments of sorrow, which we all have and we all get disappointed, um, we looked at what would be next. So we then uh, were approached by another UK company called Be Military Fit with Bear Grylls. And it's a complete outdoor workout experience type model. So where in one aspect, the indoor small footprint type box was not gonna be viable for quite a while, 
Here was sort of more of a blue ocean strategy, right? For those that are familiar with that, it's the red oceans where the blood is and all the sharks are circling trying to go after the same stuff. But this was sort of a blue ocean thing. There haven't been a lot of companies that dominate the um, outdoor workout space. You know, there have been a few who've done a decent job, but nobody that's really dominated it. So we simply shifted and said, okay, this doesn't work. This can work, and we decided to partner with them instead to bring that brand to the United States. And uh, one thing just to kind of talk about outdoor fitness, I believe there's a huge market for outdoor fitness, um, but it can't be we're outdoors because we can't be indoors, right? Or we're outdoors because we don't want to deal with a brick and mortar. You want to create an outdoor experience. You're outdoor intentionally, um, you know, utilizing an outdoor space to its fullest. But ours was simply, you know, we realized we could no longer do this, and this is what we can do, and we moved on to something that, that was, in fact, possible. And I think it um, is partly a mindset shift, too, in the way we look at things. When things get in our way, like a pandemic and other things, and, and the things you'd mentioned earlier, you know, we can look at them one of two ways. They're either a problem, and when there's a problem, that's something that tends to stop us. Or we simply look at it as a challenge. And then we go with one of the four options that you talk about. We either pivot, or we double down, or we adapt. You know, we take those options. So I think that mindset was really important in what we were doing, and that allowed us to be successful and take on this new venture. Thank you, Chris. Amy. Yes, hello, there we go. Uh, so, for a little context uh, for my background, I grew up in the fitness industry. I like to say I've held every role that exists in the fitness industry and even spa. I'm a certified massage therapist back in the day and ran spas as well. So, I have a little bit of history um, with running large club chains as well as owning my own studio, which had MindBody online software, by the way, uh, way back in the early 2000s. Um, but in the year 2019, in the summer of 2019, I stepped into a role to lead IDEA Health and Fitness Association, which is an association of fitness professionals, um, nutritionists, we have sports professionals, we also have business owners, club and studio owners. And so then the pandemic hit and talk about challenges in leadership and stepping into a new role and then taking, taking on all the challenges of the pandemic. But Hopefully today I will be able to share a perspective from the practitioner and the fit pro that maybe you are hearing in your own businesses or you haven't heard yet. Um, you know, the biggest change and the biggest shift that exists now that didn't exist two years ago is that now the consumer is conditioned to have fitness where they want it, when they want it, with any presenter anywhere in the world at any time they would like. And the consumer is driving this massive shift to digital content. But then again, now a personal trainer and a group fitness instructor can also operate their business at any time, anywhere in the world. When I'm on vacation in Hawaii, um, it's really changed the dynamic of how people can run their businesses. And so with that shift in mind, if you are running a brick and mortar studio or if you're an entrepreneur that is, is running a business that doesn't rely on a studio, it's outdoor, or you're an entrepreneur thinking about growing a digital-based business, the opportunity now is that there are no walls. You're not restricted to your zip code. You can build community given the tech and the, um, the knowledge that we have today that we didn't have two years ago. And to us, that's really exciting. To our fitness professionals, that's really exciting, and I think that we're, we've just really um, tapped the beginning of that potential of where we can impact more people using the technology that we have today. Um, and by the way, I did work for Les Mills for two years prior to this role, so I was knocking on your doors saying, hey, there's this digital content you might want to take advantage of, and by the way, your members could have fitness on their app. I didn't get a lot of takers back then, but you know I know they're doing very well now. So, uh, so we saw this coming. It's wildly available, and the question is, how will you leverage what exists today uh, that we didn't have two years ago or you didn't know existed? Thank you, Amy. Brett. Well, to sort of echo some of your sentiments, Rick, from your presentation, I think first, you know, there's there's nothing like going through a global pandemic to make you take stock of your life. And, and the first change in perspective for me was how grateful I am to work in an industry that uh, not only you know, will make money and, and, and create wealth for its participants, but also it helps people live longer, happier lives. So that was the first sort of important shift. The second was it made me more bullish about the wellness industry and the role that we all and you all especially 
uh, can play in, in impacting people's lives. Uh, our customers are telling us that they need us, they need you, they need these experiences. Uh, and so uh, incredibly bullish for uh, the outcome that we always thought would be there, but on, on a bigger scale. And then the third, on a faster scale, the pandemic also accelerated key secular tailwinds. The most obvious, of course, being the opportunity to build digital businesses, but other interesting trends emerged. For example, corporations are no longer just spending money on gym memberships for their employees. They have employees who have moved all around the world and country, and so they need new solutions. So, for example, at ClassPass, we built a really big corporate business where we can actually get a share of those dollars from corporations, not just going to big box gyms, but also to uh, boutique uh, studio fitness partners. And third, accelerating the trend of things like AI, ML, automated revenue management, marketing tools. You know, this industry desperately needs the revenue more than we did 18 months ago. And so um, I'm hoping that will accelerate the, uh, the, the penetration and adoption of some of those technologies. Thank you, Fred. Lisa. Hi, everybody. So what has changed? Boy, so many things. Um, when I think back on my journey of when I started in the industry, esthetician, makeup artist, worked in salons before there were spas, went into consulting, became a spa consultant. And when people on airplanes asked me what I did and I said I'm a spa consultant, they would say, oh, you sold hot tubs? Mm -hmm. And so now people don't say that anymore. They think, oh, that's great. You can make a living doing that. And things were growing great for all of us, right? I mean, business was so moving forward and impactful and people wanted to get spa treatments. And then, March of 2020 happened. And it's one thing for the fitness side, the uh, class side, but it's another for appointment-based businesses. Can I see a show of hands? How many of you are salon, spa, appointment-based? Great, thank you. So we haven't found a way to deliver facials virtually yet. Um, we did a lot of practice on how to show people how to do it on Zoom and consults, but we can't touch people online. And we had a tremendously hard time staying relevant to consumers as shutdowns dragged on in this state in particular. <clears throat> Flash forward to today, every spa or salon that I consult with in the United States is as busy as they've ever been. The only thing that stops us is staff is having enough people to perform the treatments. So that's a challenge that we can't fix in this hour or this week, but I will say that what's good is that we have the consumer's attention. They want what we offer. They want to come in and they understand the value of personal health and they understand the role that their own activities play in that. Um, at MindBody, we've done a few surveys. In fact, we just did one in July of over 1,000 consumers, and 65% said wellness is more important to them than ever. So now is our moment, all of us in this room, because we have that consumer attention, and we need to use it well moving forward. You know, Lisa, I couldn't agree more. You know, when, when the pandemic hit, you know, we, we call it Friday the 13th. It was actually Friday the 13th of March 2020, um, we saw across our platform the instant shutting off of almost every business in every country, in every vertical, um, a kind of black swan event that we could not have imagined. And what we did immediately in our team was realize that we had to, to accelerate the delivery of tools that would enable a hybrid business model. We saw so many of you just jumping on to off-the-shelf tools um, like Zoom, you know, and Instagram Live, and others so you could stay connected to your clientele. The pace of innovation and adaptation was so awesome to watch. And we realized that our platform needed to serve that faster. We were, we were going to release a virtual wellness platform by the end of the summer. Our team worked basically seven days a week, um, an incredible effort. Uh, it was like a, a moonshot to get it out um, in April. And so if you haven't seen that, it's out there. And, um, because we did, we did not know how this would change consumer behavior. What we're really pleased to see, and you're gonna hear more about this in the next two days, is that actually it hasn't changed consumer behavior that much. As soon as every state opened up, 
the pace of activity on the virtual wellness platform would drop and it would commensurately rise in the face-to-face. -face. We also saw, and you just spoke to it, that actually consumers are putting more value on face-to-face -face experiences, which is really gratifying. And so if you haven't raised your prices yet, you should. If there's no other message to deliver here, yes, let's have a hand for that. Not, not because you're greedy people, you're not. You wouldn't be in this industry if you were greedy people, but because you need to have a vibrant, stable business. And if you starve your business and you starve yourself, you're not gonna be there to help people lead healthier, happier lives tomorrow. So please evaluate that closely. And in almost every case I've seen, you should be raising your prices. So well, it's an extremely exciting to see that. Yes? I wanna jump on that and second what Rick just said because uh, especially in the appointment-based side, we have razor-thin margins as it is, and we've been afraid to charge more than the guy down the street. But we know as consumers now that when you want something, you'll pay whatever these days. We're just so happy to get it, including a coffee this afternoon because the Starbucks inexplicably closes at 11. So um, you now's our time to just put it out there and do it because we can't pay our people more, and this, this is not about that conversation, but I just want to put that out there because we hear that now and then. Oh, we'd get more employees if we just paid them more. There isn't more to pay them, you know, but we can create benefits and other options if we raise our prices and we are strategic about that financial piece. So please, seconding Rick's point, examine what you're doing and, and what your margin is, and let's move on it. So the other thing that came up there from Lisa is uh, staffing. So let's go around the, the group and talk about what are you seeing in the staffing of your businesses? What strategies are you employing to get the best and brightest talent on your team? So I'll, I'll start. So we've seen a lot of places have to go with a leaner staff who then has more responsibility. That's been pretty common through brick and mortar facilities and fitness, right? Because we don't have the attendance levels we had and they're not back up to 100% yet. So you cut some people and the people that you keep have to do more. Now that's a tough situation, right? I mean, and what it boils down to is great leadership. And in that particular case, what great leaders do is they infuse a culture where the people that work on your team understand the purpose of what they do, why it's so important. A great leader will really infuse the vision, mission, and values of the company so that everybody understands that what they're doing has meaning. So they're willing to go the extra mile. Then also that goes with employee engagement, right? We want employees who are really engaged because if they're heavily engaged, they do a better job. Now, um, kind of as, as uh, Lisa was saying, you know, where some of us are in a situation, many facilities where we can't really afford to do raises right now. We're not really in a position to do promotions and bonuses. And those are major factors when it comes to employee engagement. But for those of you familiar with the Gallup Q12, which is the world's most renowned employee engagement survey, when you look at those 12 questions, I would argue that six, at least six, but probably seven or eight revolve around feeling like you have purpose and meaning in your job and that what you do is appreciated. And again, that's the foremost survey on employee engagement. So as leaders, in addition to infusing the culture and reminding your staff of the purpose and the difference that they make, it's also making sure that you consistently express gratitude and appreciation for those team members. Because again, outside of the financial pieces that some of us can't offer right now, all the research from Gallup shows that if you just show frequent, timely, and specific appreciation to your team, they will stay heavily engaged and do a great job even though there's less of them and they have to do more for you. Amy, what are you That's saying? Great. Yeah, so uh, in talking to our club and studio owners, of course, hiring is their number one pain point. It was before the pandemic, but of course that is even more painful now that they're trying to get employees to come back to service the members. Uh, so some of the what we're seeing is really encouraging business owners to think more deeply about their benefit package. Chris talked about engagement and really thinking about you know, what motivates this employee to be part of your facility and, and what's, in, what's helping them to be bought into your vision. But beyond that, now more than ever, employees want to know what you stand for. They want to know that you are that you have values, and they want to feel that this is an inclusive community, not only for your members but for the employees themselves. And I think as leaders, it's important that we really share what we believe in and and how we're trying to create inclusive businesses in inclusive communities, and and say that loud and proud more than ever. It will attract like-minded employees to your business. 
Um, but beyond that, we're really challenging club owners to think differently about the traditional model. So for those that are choosing to stay in person, that's fantastic, that's their model, but there's also these blended models that are emerging and thinking about how they can attract uh, the fitness professional back who may have started an online business out of necessity, how can you invite that person back and think about the business model differently? For example, creating a small streaming area of your club where that professional could have streamed sessions for members who choose not to come back to the facility just yet. Um, and or I've, and one large club chain is extending their app to, to trainers who aren't even employees of their business, but will use the app to attract clientele and to use that technology to meet people anywhere in the world. So um, we're trying to look at the business differently. We think the old model might need some shaking up as we try to attract staff back to the clubs. And particularly because, as, as we said, employees have more options than ever before. Um, and some employees may never come back just like some members may never come back. And that's a part of the reality of the pandemic as well. Brett. Just, just two, two sort of insights that we see from our, our partner network. The first is that you can sort of turn lemons into lemonade here. While there are per pervasive labor shortages, people are sitting up and taking stock of what they wanna do with their free time. And a lot of people are interested in becoming a professional fitness or wellness instructor or, mm. or practitioner. And we've seen a number of our top partners who have launched training programs, certification programs, who are actually bringing a lot of people, not only turning that into a revenue stream, but bringing in labor and talent into the industry. Uh, and then the second kind of critical insight, and not to steal the thunder of, of Zach after our chief commercial officer, who's giving a presentation tomorrow on the data that we're seeing in trends, but the top practitioners and instructors are five to 10 times more valuable than the average in terms of the revenue that they're gonna generate for a business. And so getting really hardcore and rigorous about evaluating performance in those first 30, 60, 90 days uh, is, is the second thing. And when you find those people, bear hug them, make sure they don't go anywhere. Excellent, thank you. Lisa, what are you seeing in your industry? So on the appointment-based side, we have that same staffing challenge and I think it's exponentially bigger than it may be in fitness or studio. Imagine you have an instructor come in to teach a class to 20 people. Well, for us to service 20 people, we need 20 man hours of a one-on-one -on -one with an employee. So to fill our books, we need more people than we ever did. And oh, surprise, there's less of them applying than there ever were. And we're not going to fix that, as I said earlier. There's not a magic wand. It's a combination of reasons. And I think what we have to do is stand back and say, how are we creating revenue in the spaces we are paying for? And this whole one-on-one, -on -one, I make a reservation for a, an hour with this one practitioner model is a little dated. And I don't think it's going away, but I think we have to think, well, what else can we do? You know, are there things we can do that are self-catered? Can we have equipment people can use for a fee? Can we have a self-help bar? Can we have more um, events and not be so appointment driven? You know, young people today, they don't want to make an appointment for next Saturday. They get up in the morning and they want to go do something fun with their friends. We are not friendly to that group. What can we do? I just saw a picture this week of a, a spa studio in Shanghai where they turn their retail area into a streaming area and they have cameras and they let influencers come in and film live streams on their products, which creates revenue in a space that was just sitting there selling retail. Very innovative things happening. Just let's pay attention and think about, we're not going back. There's no going back, right? The forward is how do we take what we used to do and morph it for the future? Thank you. Well, that's a perfect segue because our closing topic is now the question that I, I put it up, but they just moved it again. And that was what innovations and opportunities are going to drive the wellness industry in the decade ahead? And so let's do this as a rapid fire. We've got uh, less than nine minutes left here. So 30 seconds to one minute each. What are your top innovations and opportunities you see out there happening in the decade ahead that's gonna drive your corner of the industry? You wanna kick it off, Brett? Yeah, as the tech geek up here, I can kick off. I think yeah. first is just taking advantage of all the discovery tools out there. 
new, 90% of our customers are new to this industry. People are looking to come into the industry and what are they looking for? They don't know the brands. They look for the reviews. They're looking at the experiences that other people have had. So make sure that you're establishing strong presence and taking advantage of all these different review platforms. We've done 75 million reviews. Second, similarly, is social. Somebody coming with a friend to an experience at one of your locations in, in fitness or in wellness or spa salon, they are 5x more likely to try a new experience than if they're going on their own. So find a way to indulge and, 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 uh, and encourage those social experience, experiences. Third uh, is, I think, how machine learning and AI can help your business. So automated uh, revenue management, algorithmic revenue management, at ClassPass we have you know, dynamic pricing, MindBody has dynamic pricing tools. Uh, you talk about raising prices, well I'd let the algorithm figure it out, uh, as long as it's a revenue maximizing algorithm. And uh, uh, you know, doing things like using ML to establish which instructors are your best, which location should you launch your business in. The whole, all of these tools are coming down the pipe and are gonna completely change everything. Awesome, Fritz. Amy. Well, I'm going to double down on my message of no walls fitness. And what I mean by that, whether you're brick or mortar or not, is to really rethink how you can reach more people with your business globally and, and not just in your zip code. And I, I think that's the biggest opportunity that we're going to see emerge from this. And, and you'll, you'll find that if you listen to your consumer, they're going to tell you what they want now that they've had a taste of what's possible. They're going to tell you what they want and you absolutely absolutely can rethink your membership model, your compensation model, to attract big rock star talent, have them work with your local club, but attract um, memberships globally. And I think that's the biggest message I would share in terms of no walls fitness. Um, and then just in terms of fitness professionals and the growth for the profession, um, I think the risk in the fact that we are low staffed right now, both in the spa and the salon and in fitness, is that we might lower our standards in hiring. And so I would just encourage us all to maintain the high level of quality with certification and licensure and not let that standard fall and lean on organizations like IDEA and URSA to help you upskill and develop and give career guidance to your fitness professionals and your spa and salon and nutritionists and business owners along the way. That's what we do. We're here to guide you through the process and meet you where you are and help you flourish in your career. Nice. Chris? Uh, so, so two quick things. I think uh, one is innovate. And, and I think MindBody and ClassPass are very innovative companies, but outside of that, our industry has been horrible at innovating. We've always, I think, been a little behind most other industries. So don't wait for something like a pandemic to cause an inf the innovation. It sparked it. Keep going with it. Prior to the pandemic, if I said, hey, do you want to work out virtually through Zoom? You'd have been like, dude, you're nuts. Now it's a normal thing. Or how about this? If I would say, hey, you want to meet for happy hour on Zoom? You would have been like, no, and you have a problem and you should seek help immediately. Now we're all doing it, right? Everybody's done that. So don't, don't wait anymore to innovate. Use this awesome technology for data and research and to make the user experience even better. And then the second thing really quickly is, you know, URSA research has showed that, let's say prior to the pandemic, only about 20% of the population belongs to health clubs or facilities or studios. What we need to do is tap that 80% who don't belong. And we've been trying for years. Now, a silver lining to this pandemic is that now, beyond a shadow of a doubt, everybody knows how important exercise is. Rick said it earlier. Um, if you look up Kaiser Permanente, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, but if you were physically active based on the regular recommendations, then you were less likely to have a negative outcome with COVID, which meant being hospitalized, ICU admissions, or death right, just by being physically active. So it's in the forefront of everybody's mind. So as you move forward, and I guess this falls in line with innovation, think about your marketing and your messaging and how we elevate this industry to the essential industry that it is. Because what everybody decided was exercise is essential. Nobody argued that. No matter where you stood on any year you view with the pandemic, nobody would say exercise wasn't good, right? But what they said was, but I guess facilities and studios aren't really essential because they were the first to be shut down, one of the last to be open, right? So what we need to do collectively is, is message to that 80% and be more about health and wellness and show how we change people's lives. Because we are in that rare industry that we have the opportunity to massively change people's lives for the better. And, and I'm not sure there's anything better than that. Awesome, Chris. Lisa. Great points, Chris. Um, so the pandemic taught us something that we always knew, we just didn't recognize, which is that we don't know the future. 
business is always able to change at a moment. It just didn't. You know, we had years and years of progressive growth and no big surprises, and we all were suddenly taught that, wow, we don't really know what's going to happen tomorrow, do we? So I think we need to go forward thoughtfully and stop doing the same thing we always did and look around and open your eyes and travel and read other publications and go to other trade shows, and let's try and be fresh and different because... When you look at the trends the Global Wellness Institute puts out and what's happening, they're not narrow, they're very broad. You, you just need to pay attention and read things outside of your normal scope because we have to think quick. We have a huge opportunity. Uh, the industry of wellness has been sized at four and a half trillion dollars, trillion. Um, the biggest bubble in there, one trillion, is beauty but that's also products. Uh, fitness, 800 billion, doing well. Spa, 112 billion, it's a little dot. We have a lot of room to grow because consumers want what we're spending. Deloitte says by 2040 that 60% of spending will be on preventive wellness, not on the insurance and the cures we have now. So let's stay ahead of the curve, Think fast and don't be afraid to be different than your neighbors. Absolutely. I'll just add, I agree with everything that uh, you guys said, and I'll add this. COVID has given us a giant gift, and that is an enormous amount of data around the impacts of health and fitness and wellness on large populations. We know what it costs to be unwell now. And so while all of us were all preaching to the choir here, we knew this, right? We've known this for, for decades. We've committed our lives to that belief, but now we actually have the data. And with big data techniques and AIML, uh, the ability to track health healthcare outcomes, now we're gonna be able to get insurance companies, employers, and governments behind this, actually putting dollars behind it. And I think that's gonna address that 80%. And I think that we're gonna see that 20% membership number has been stubbornly static for the last several years. We're gonna see that accelerating rapidly. And I truly believe, after 21 years of watching this industry, the opportunity ahead of us in the decade ahead is larger than the two decades behind us combined. You're gonna see enormous growth. You guys are sitting at the right place at the right time. You got through an insanely difficult year and a half. Get ready, because this is gonna be exciting. Thanks, everybody. And thank you to our panelists for getting out from behind the Zoom screen and showing up.